Welcome to the Cardiac Emma Learner Series, a unique video tutorial program under the aegis of Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. This program is focused on beginners and intermediate images with learning happening through short sessions and case-based discussions. We are grateful to experts from different parts of India who have helped us in putting this program together. Please do feel free to give us your feedback so we can continually improve such training opportunities. This session is by Dr. Vishnu Vardhan Ravila, who is a consultant radiologist and cardiovascular imaging lead in care hospitals, High Tech City, Hyderabad. His expertise is in cardiac imaging and image guided intervention planning for electrophysiology studies. He is certified by the Society of Cardiac MR, CVCTA, and IACI and has a publication in Indian Heart Journal. He has given multiple lectures at state and national level conferences and has conducted workshops on cardiac MR and cardiac CT for doctors. He is a trainer for DNB radio diagnosis and has conducted multiple sessions for them. He is also an executive committee member of the Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. Hello everybody. Uh, in this uh, short video, we will see how cardiac MRI can help us in evaluating various pericardial pathologies. First, we will look at the pericardial anatomy in brief and then go on to the various imaging features. Pericardium is a sac that envelops the heart and the proximal portions of the great vessels. It has an outer fibrous layer and an inner serous layer. The fibrous layer is more distensible than the serous layer and it is usually attached to the diaphragm, sternum and postal cartilages and the proximal portions of the great vessels. So the serous pericardium has an outer parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. Parietal layer lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium to which it is adhered closely and the visceral layer envelops the epicardial surface of the heart. Usually, the pericardial cavity houses about 15 to 50 ml of fluid, which can be physiological. In this diagram, we can clearly see the different layers in the pericardium. The outermost layer is the fibrous pericardium, which is attached to the chest wall. And deeper to that, you have your serous pericardium, which has two layers. The parietal layer of the serous pericardium, which is closely adhered to the fibrous pericardium, and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium which lines the epicardial surface of the heart and your pericardial cavity is the space between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium where the fluid is collected. So what is the function of the pericardium? First and foremost it fixes the position of the heart within the mediastinum and decreases the friction of the cardiac movements by the way of a mild pericardial fluid in the pericardial sac. It also has a function of limiting the spread of diseases from the adjacent structures to the heart. Then secondly, it has a role in transmitting the intrathoracic pressures into the cardiac chambers, which in turn help in filling of the ventricle and atrial chamber during different cardiac phases. It also helps in the interdependence of the left and right ventricular filling, known as ventricular coupling. This slide shows us the different kinds of sequences which are useful in evaluating the heart in general and these two sequences which are highlighted are important in this scenario because these are two sequences which are specifically designed to evaluate various pericardial pathologies. Apart from these two sequences, the rest of the sequences are the standard SEMR recommended imaging protocols which are done in our daily clinical practice. Coming to how the pericardium looks on MRI, the normal pericardium is a smooth and curvilinear structure surrounded on either side by the high signal intensity of the epicardial and pericardial fan. It has a low to intermediate signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted images and as well as on protein cine images. The normal pericardium measures anywhere between 1.2 to 1.7 mm in thickness. The pericardium is definitely abnormal whenever its thickness is more than 4 millimeters. So these are the images which are black blood 
uh, fast spin echo sequences where you can see nicely the thin pericardium which is sandwiched between the pericardial and epicardial fat so the outer layer is the pericardial fat and the inner layer of bright signal is the epicardial fat so coming to common pericardial pathologies uh, we'll uh, go through one by one a simple translative effusion will have a very low signal intensity on t1 weighted images and very high signal intensity on t2 weighted images in complex effusions such as exudative effusion or hemorrhagic pericardial effusion the fluid can show high signal on t1 weighted image and can show intermediate signal intensity on t2 weighted images based on the content in the pericardial fluid you can use uh, echo criteria to have a fair uh, estimate of the pericardial fluid like you can call it as a small pericardial effusion if the largest pocket is less than 10 mm and moderate if the pocket is between 10 to 20 mm and large if the pocket is more than 20 mm if you want to use specific cmr criteria you can use it only when you have a circumferential pericardial effusion if the effusion is circumferential and you can measure fluid anterior to the rv free wall then you can use this criteria if the thickness of the fluid anterior to the rv free wall is less than 4 mm it, can, it is considered small pericardial effusion if the thickness is more than 5 mm it is a moderate pericardial effusion which will uh, estimate the fluid to be around 100 to 500 ml this slide shows us how pericardial fluid can look in different cardiac mri sequences the first image is a white blood t2 weighted image where the pericardial fluid is depicted as very hyper intense fluid the second image is a t1 weighted black blood image where the pericardial fluid is very hypo intense the third image is a late gadolinium enhancement image or our psir sequence wherein the fluid is shown as a very jet black or very black area so this is how a transudative pericardial fusion will look on different sequences the last image is a t2 weighted black blood image but in this sequence you can see the pericardial fluid to be very intermediate signal intensity this is because this patient has a exudative pericardial effusion so uh, nowadays with the usage of uh, uh, native t1 mapping it is possible to uh, identify uh, whether the effusion being transudative or exudative so this is based on the principle that whenever the protein concentration in a fluid increases its t1 value decreases so higher the protein content lower the t1 value so higher protein content is usually found in exudative fluid effusion so there are, there, there are uh, cutoffs uh, described for both plural and pericardial effusions which are different so in a plural effusion if the t1 value the native t1 value is more than 3440 millisecond it is usually a transudative plural effusion if it is less than 3440 milliseconds it is uh, it can be uh, exudative fluid Similarly, for pericardial effusions, the cutoff value for a transudate versus exudate is 3013 milliseconds. So, continuing from that, this is an image example showing how different concentration of the albumin in the in vitro model is showing uh, decreasing T1 time with increasing albumin concentration. So, as the albumin concentration increases, the T1 value decreases. These are again uh, examples showing uh, exudative fluid, how it looks on T1 mapping, and transudative fluid, how it looks on. T1 mapping, and this is an example of hemorrhagic pericardial effusion where you can see that the T1 values of the blood pool is uh, very close to that of the pericardial fluid, so prompting us to call it as a hemorrhagic effusion. Coming to cardiac tamponade, so whenever there is a rapid accumulation of uh, fluid or gas or solid air uh, mass in the pericardial cavity, the patient tends to develop cardiac tamponade. So the important point is rapid accumulation. So, this usually results in elevation of the intrapericardial pressure that decreases ventricular filling and eventually decreased stroke volumes, which leads to symptoms for the patient. MRI is usually not the primary modality to diagnose cardiac tamponade, it is usually diagnosed on echo. Now, let us look what are the signs of tamponade on cardiac MRI. Usually, in patients with tamponade, you can see dilated SVC, IVC, and hepatic veins. And then 
because of the increased intrapericardial pressures the anterior surface of the heart becomes flat in very severe cases of tamponade there is diastolic inversion which is nothing but collapse of the right ventricle free wall in the early diastole and collapse of the right atrial free wall during late diastole and early systolic phases in more severe cases the cardiac chambers are compressed along with compression of the coronary sinus pulmonary trunk or the ivc so this is a uh, cine sequences showing two cases uh, with signs of tamponade uh, in this image you can find that the right atrial free wall is uh, being compressed it is being driven inside during the late diastolic phase similarly in this example we can see that the right ventricular free wall is being compressed during early diastolic phase so this in the setting of uh, pericardial fluid should prompt us to uh, identify cardiac tamponade on cardiac mri coming to the next important topic of pericarditis there are usually different uh, pathologies which can result in pericardial inflammation uh, namely idiopathic inflammation uh, secondary to any infective pathology secondary to systemic autoimmune disease which can involve the pericardium in case of uremia and myocardial infection so this is an example of how a classical pericarditis due to, due to viral infection can look on mri so on still images you can find that the entire pericardium is thickened and edematous uh you can see a bright signal in the pericardium uh when contrast is given and the late gadolin images are acquired you can see the uh, diffuse intense enhancement of the pericardium which is thickened so this is how a pericarditis will appear on imaging we will discuss a uh, case example this is a young patient uh, who has presented with chest pain and palpitation so what you can see here is uh, the lateral wall of the lv is a uh, uh hypokinetic same thing is seen on the four chamber view here as well as the three chamber view uh as you can see in the white blood image sequences the pericardial thickening is normal here as well as here the pericardium thickening is normal when you do still images you can find that the there is a focal high signal intensity in the pericardium along the lateral wall of the lv as seen in the short axis as well as the four chamber view now when contrast is administered you can see intense enhancement of the pericardium as well as the epicardial surface of the heart on the lateral wall which is corresponding to the area of the hypokinesia so this patient which showed intense fdg uptake in the lateral segment of the lv as well as the pericardium confirming the uh, diagnosis of myopericarditis this is a good guide which shows how cardiac mri is helpful in guiding the treatment for patient of pericarditis so initial diagnosis of pericarditis is established on cardiac mri based on that evidence treatment is started with anti inflammatories or disease modifying drugs in case of autoimmune uh, pericarditis and then after a gap of 4 months a cardiac mri is repeated if the features of pericardial inflammation are decreased or not seen in the subsequent scan you can stop the treatment but if the features of pericarditis are still persistent you can prolong the treatment to get better results so coming to pericardial constriction uh, whenever the pericardium becomes non elastic it impairs the left ventricular diastolic filling which eventually results in elevated systemic venous pressures which leads to low cardiac output states causing symptoms for the patient usually in case of constrictive pericarditis the pericardium is either thickened or calcified so whenever you find a pericardial thickening of more than 4 mm it is an indicator of constriction but one thing to remember is thickening does not always imply constriction and constriction can be seen without pericardial thickening so on imaging a constrictive physiology should be suspected whenever you find a tubular configuration of the ventricles with biatrial dilatation with respiratory pressure variations in ventricles so this is an example of uh, constrictive pericarditis how do you call it per constrictive pericarditis you can see a tubular configuration of the left ventricle and you can see both the right atrium and left atrium are dilated and you can see circumferential thickening of the pericardium which is definitely more than 4 mm
same features can also be seen in the short axis view diffusely thickened pericardium and one more important uh, feature to notice in this sequence is, uh, is we can see a septal bounce which is classic of constrictive pericarditis which is more accentuated in the basal septum you can see that very well in the short axis also we can see that the there is a sudden shuddering of the septum during diastolic phase so that is a important feature in constrictive physiology uh, in the same patient and delayed enhancement images you can find circumferential thickening as well as intense enhancement of the pericardium so this is a case of constrictive pericarditis a few words about grid sequence where it can be used and how it is helpful to differentiate pericardial constrictive physiology in a normal grid sequence the lines crossing from the myocardium to the pericardium are continuous in the diastole whereas during systolic phase they become discontinuous because there is slippage of the pericardium from the myocardium which is a normal phenomenon so whenever there is some tethering or there are adhesions between the pericardium and the myocardium these lines on the grid sequence they tend not to get disrupted they remain continuous or contiguous so this that is shown in this image as well as the next image here you can nicely see that the pericardial grid as well as the myocardial grid they are in continuation with one another during the entire cardiac phase they are not getting disrupted so that is how a grid sequence will help us to identify whether the pericardium is slipping away from the myocardium or not so whenever it is not slipping whenever these lines are continuous during entire cardiac cycle it is a sign of constrictive pericarditis coming to this example here uh, you can find features of uh, tubular ventricles as well as biatrial dilatation as well as a large pericardial effusion if you see closely there is some amount of shuddering happening in the basal septum but to be sure to differentiate this appearance which can always be seen in the case of restrictive cardiomyopathy you have one more important sequence which will come to our aid namely the real time free breathing cine sequence this sequence is very important in differentiating a case of uh, constrictive pericarditis versus a restrictive cardiomyopathy we acquire an entire 1 minute sequence when the patient is freely breathing so what we have to uh, concentrate is whenever the diaphragm is moving down in inspiration we have to observe the intraventricular septum during the inspiration the septum tends to flatten or move into the left ventricle which is a sign of constrictive physiology so in this patient you can see whenever the heart is going into the diastole Uh, during the inspiration the septum is getting flattened it is moving into the left ventricle that happens in case of constrictive physiology this is because of the varying interventricular pressures during inspiratory cycle which is a hallmark of constrictive pericarditis or constrictive physiology this is a uh, algorithm which will help us to differentiate constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy as you can see patient history jugular venous pressures and lab and ecg or x ray findings are usually not helping in differentiating both the conditions but whereas uh, dynamic imaging in uh, echo or cardiac mri can be helpful in differentiating constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy so coming to pericardial neoplasms the one, the most common pericardial neoplasms are highlighted here uh, which are benign lesions like a lipoma or a pericardial cyst followed by the most common malignant lesion being the uh, metastatic disease from usually breast carcinoma this is an example of pericardial cyst which is showing very low signal intensity on t1 weighted image and high signal intensity on t2 weighted image and does not show any enhancement on contrast imaging example of a pericardial cyst in a classical location right cardiophrenic angle this is an example of a focal mass lesion arising from the pericardium as seen here and uh, you can also see mild pericardial effusion and this uh, lesion is a fibrosarcoma which is showing low signal intensity on ssf ssf sequence 
intermediate signal on T1, high signal on T2 weighted images, and shows intense heterogeneous enhancement on contrast study. Similarly, uh, this is an example where you can see uh, the entire pericardium is diffusely thickened and it is showing uh, intermediate signal intensity on T2 weighted images and showing low to intermediate signal intensity on cine sequences which are SSFP sequences uh, on T1 weighted images uh, uh, you can as well see a nicely demonstrated uh, diffuse pericardial thickening encasing the entire heart on still images you can find intense heterogeneous T2 signal T2 hyper intensity involving the diffusely thickened pericardium in case in the heart. So on dynamic first pass perfusion, you can see only a mild or subtle enhancement in the uh, pericardial mass. On contrast imaging, you can see intensely enhancing thickened pericardium. So this uh, turned out to be uh, mesothelioma of the pericardium. Congenital absence of pericardium is very rare. It is usually partial or complete. It is important to identify partial uh, agenesis or absence of the pericardium because some of these patients will have herniation of the heart through the partial absence of the pericardium, which can eventually lead to strangulation of the heart leading to death. These are the image examples uh, showing uh, complete absence of the pericardium where the heart is. Uh, shifted or located in the left hemithorax because there is no pericardium anchoring it in the middle of the mediastinum. This is a, a slice taken at a higher level showing that the pulmonary trunk is in direct contact with the lung parenchyma which usually never occurs in the presence of a normal pericardium. This last image is an example showing a focal absence of the pericardium near the cardiac apex through the defect in the pericardium there, you can see the LV and RV apices protruding or herniating outside. So whenever the defect is large and the herniation is large, that part of the myocardium or the LV cavities can get strangulated leading to death of the patient. So in conclusion, cardiac MRI can play important role in evaluating various pericardial pathologies. It is very helpful modality to differentiate transplant from X-ray by using latest parametric mapping images. It is a very good modality to diagnose as well as follow patients with inflammatory pericarditis. And it is a very important modality to differentiate constrictive from restrictive physiology in the heart. We can also evaluate various pericardial masses and classify them as being benign versus malignant so that the appropriate treatment choice can be taken. And with the advent of native T1 mapping sequences, there are many more opportunities to be explored how these mapping sequences can be helpful to evaluate the pericardial pathologies.